Good evening. I will call this meeting of the Housing Authority of the City of Salem for Monday, August 24th, 2020 to order. If the recorder will please call the roll. Vice Chair Kayser, absent. Commissioner Anderson. Present. Commissioner Nanke. Here. Commissioner Leung. Here. Commissioner Osik. Here. Chair Hoy. Here. Commissioner Nordyke. Here. Commissioner Lewis. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do not believe we have any additions or deletions to the agenda. We have nobody signed up for public comment. Uh, Commissioner Lewis, could I get you to make a motion on the consent calendar, please? Sure. Uh, I move the acceptance of the consent calendar. Second. Okay. So moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Anderson. Thank you. I, I have some discussion that I think not on the partly the consent calendar, but I've already talked to Ms. Utz and she's going to talk about that and, and her report as well. All right. Any other discussion? Seeing no hands, if the uh, recorder will please call the call for the vote, call the roll. Chair Hoy? Aye. Commissioner Nordyke? Aye. Vice Chair Kayser, absent. Commissioner Lewis? Aye. Commissioner Anderson? Aye. Commissioner Nanke? Aye. Commissioner Leung? Aye. Commissioner Osik? Aye. Thank you. Thank sure, you. Boy. You were probably expecting me to ask uh, Commissioner Lewis to actually go over the consent calendar. And <laughs> I skipped that part. Sure. I boy. apologize. Yes. Um, I think we still need to do the Pledge of Allegiance, too. <laughs> Thank you. I am not on my A game, apparently. I apologize to everybody for that. I will back up uh, to the Pledge of Allegiance. And uh, if you'll join me, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and my apologies for skipping over that. Um, and and I'm, I'm sorry, also, I, um, if I could, I'll go over the consent calendar. It's, that would be uh, great. It's very short. It consists of the um, uh, Salem Housing Authority minutes from the July 27th meeting, and also um, the application and acceptance of CARES Act supplemental funding for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Thank you. Uh, uh, excuse me. Also, uh, 3.3B is the application for an acceptance of funding from Oregon 2020-2021 Permanent Supportive Housing Institute. Thank you. I see we have no public hearings, no special orders of business, but we do have an information report and we have Ms. Utes here to uh, discuss that with us. Before we do that, I just want to give you and your staff one more congratulations on the amazing work on, on Redwood Crossings. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, facility and uh, I couldn't be happier and more proud of the work you all did. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Nicole Yates. I'm the Housing Administrator for Salem Housing Authority. And tonight um, on the program management report, you'll see that we do have a new hire for that housing navigator position, which has been much anticipated. Um, that individual has been spending some great quality time out with other partners and collaborating and is already learning the role very quickly. So we're very, very happy to have Betty Jordan come join us at the Housing Authority. She's excited and I think it's gonna be a really good fit for us. It was great timing too, just in time for Redwood Crossings to open. Um, Redwood Crossings is officially, we do have the certificate of occupancy and today we placed four individuals into that uh, complex. So we Excellent. wanted to let everybody know that we did make those placements today. We had some very excited individuals that were so grateful and so thankful um, for that project and that opportunity. We wanted to let you all know that we will be taking that slowly for COVID-19 reasons and to be strategic with each of these clients to ensure that they, they all understand the building, the safety protocol, and that we give allowance for each person to come in and out of the building while they move in so we don't have 37 units filled all at once trying to move in 
and on top of each other, um, not keeping social distance. So the goal in talking with the funding partners and everybody involved is that we'll be 50% occupied by the end of this month, which we will be um, from what our schedule is showing. And then 100% leased by the end of September. Um, things went very smooth today. We had a great team out there. Um, each of the clients that moved in were able to spend some time with both Arches and both with Salem Housing Authority. Um, we're given full tours of the building. Um, and they were exceptionally grateful for all the community donations that have also come in for the adopt a room packages. So we currently have 21 of our 31 rooms at Redwood Crossings have been adopted and um, the clients have moved in with this entire moving care package, which has been fantastic. So that's all gone really well. On the program management report, you'll also see that the occupancy side for our property management. I just wanted to take a, a quick note for portfolio occupancy and let you know how the RAD conversion, the rental assistance demonstration conversion of our public housing is going. There are notations at the bottom of that that is updated each month in this program management report. But since the time that we typed this report, we actually now have completed Northgate's renovation of all interior units and that complex is 100% leased up as of today, which is fantastic because we did add two additional units into that property and now all units are completely full. So we're almost nearing the completion of one half of that project and um, it's pretty exciting to us. Um, is there any questions for me? I know that Councilor or Commissioner Anderson had a question regarding the funding applications that I can quickly answer for you. So Commissioner our collection... Lewis? Well, go ahead, go ahead and answer, yeah, sorry. Oh, okay, no, so the, the two grant applications that we're submitting um, came up quickly here in this last month and they closed fairly quickly, quickly. so we didn't want to lose an opportunity to try to seek some additional funding for our community. The one that we're pretty excited for is the Permanent Supportive Housing uh, Institute of, and we actually applied for this the previous time and we came in uh, number 12 out of 20 some odd agencies that applied and they took the first 10. So we are very, very hopeful that this go around that we've added some additional um, individuals that have permanent supportive housing background. We've actually um, gone out and seek more collaborative partners working through the Redwood Crossings opening. And now with the history of being able to open Redwood Crossings, we hope that we can get in that institute this go around. It doesn't guarantee any funding. It just, if there is funding in the future, it gives you um, basically an upper hand to get that funding. So we wanna take every opportunity that we can to be able to provide more permanent supportive housing in Salem. And Sequoia Crossings is already uh, pre-designed out for 78 units of permanent supportive housing, more in an apartment style complex that would have twos and three bedrooms along with one bedrooms and hopefully the collaboration that we have at Redwood Crossings would carry over to Sequoia Crossings. The other funding that you see is for CARES Act funding. Um, we did apply for the set aside funding that was for the voucher program for some additional funding to help offset the costs that are involved with the COVID-19 and the layoffs and the additional rents that we're paying out for our voucher program. Um, this, is an op this is a secondary opportunity. We wouldn't know until October if we received that funding, but had encouraged anybody that is seeking shortfall, shortfall money to go ahead and apply for this as well. So this is another one that it's not a guarantee, but we wanna take any opportunity that we can to con uh, continue to bring more voucher assistance into this area. Commissioner Lewis. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> um, Nicole, thanks very much. I uh, want to maybe give you another minute or two to lobby on the adopter room program. I'm, I'm real curious, and I think people would be curious about it. Um, are you adopting the room for life, or are you adopting the room for a month, or the details, the cost? If you could uh, let us know. Sure. So this is actually a Mid Willamette Valley Community Action Agency and the Archers program. And I will give a, a shout out to Linda Strike, who is the, the lead there at Redwood Crossings from 
their agency and she came up with the adopt a room program which is not for a lifetime it's really if you want to donate funding or help supply items they accept donations at arches um, it is done through the arches website for contacting linda strike and you can provide hygiene items you can provide new towels new items that would welcome an individual into the into their home the actual care packages to adopt a room are costing about $150 for each complete outfit. That includes a whole set of bedding, um, additional uh, cleaning products, sanitizing products, um, brooms, dustpans, all sorts of what you could walk into a home and feel like it's a home instead of walking into an empty room that just has a bed and a table. Um, it's been a pretty successful program and we've so far outfitted 21 and the individuals were so excited to see everything that was in the units when they arrived today. And, and follow up question if I could. Um, sure. The tour that uh, I attended last week, I was, I think I mentioned this to you, I was a little surprised about the use of cameras mm -hmm. in the facility. Can you, uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So, the Redwood Crossings is actually outfitted with 49 common area cam cameras for security reasons in the building. Um, this is also done because the staff are not on site 24-7. Um, there's a security guard that is on call. Um, we're able to pull the cameras up on an instantaneous to be able to see if there's any issues that are at hand. Um, the cameras also have the ability to ensure that we know who is coming and going from the building. Um, it is not in any of the personal uh, units or the individual units. It is really a known permanent supportive housing measure to help uh, keep your building more secure. And last, if I could, um, also at that, uh, that showing, you mentioned that there's, and this is off topic a little bit, but there's a, a complex in West Salem that you're not gonna be able to utilize. I forgot the name of that. Um, can you remind me? Sure. So um, when we did, when we applied with HUD for the rental assistance demonstration, um, HUD, the project is called Glen Creek Apartments in West Salem. It's a 30 unit multifamily complex with three and four and five bedrooms. HUD declined our ability to continue with that project into the rental assistance demonstration and is no longer authorizing the use of capital fund money from our programs to do any repairs to the property. And eventually now we will have to um, go through a, uh, another process to actually sell off that property. Okay, thank you. Absolutely, Ann. Thank you, um, uh, Director Utz. I have a, a question specifically about the CARES Act of supplemental funding. Um, so provided that um, we, we get the funds and everything. Do, do households that currently participate in the voucher program need to apply to do it or do anything to be considered? No, we're already co covering the cost of what, what it will help us do is have the ability to start utilizing vouchers again. Right now we've been um, put on shortfall notice due to the uh, increase in cost per month. And so we're not authorized to issue any more vouchers, even if there are, it says that we have vouchers available right now, the cost of each of those vouchers is exceeding what we are provided by HUD. So hoping to receive these funds will give us some allowance to start utilizing some vouchers again. But our clients are already taken care of. They don't have to apply for anything. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, the second question has to do with um, your last statement specifically about what's happening in West Salem. So because you're going to have to sell those units, what's going to happen to the, uh, to the people who were, who were there? So first of all, we to... would have to apply through a demo and disposition process with HUD to um, dispose of that property. That's a terminology that HUD uses or sell the property. I, um, I'm hopeful that some of the, our other nonprofits that we actually manage properties for, I have been in communication if they would be interested in potentially taking on that project to keep it in the manner that it is now, maybe through tax credits and private partnership. Uh, the state of Oregon through Oregon Housing and Community Services was not concerned with its location being in a floodway. However, HUD's environmental review would not allow for us to continue with any funding 
um, for capital improvements for that project. So um, there is hope that even uh, we can find some sort of partnership to, to retain it in its current use. Um, but otherwise, if we can't, we would need to dispose of it and then um, rebuild another complex. Our hopes would be that we could relocate them into a new complex before we actually have to just uh, sell off or dispose of the other project. But either way, the clients that are there would be completely taken care of through the Uniform Relocation Act, just like they are um, the other clients of ours are during this renovation project. Thank you. Thank you. And before we continue, I would just like to acknowledge that we have guest commissioner um, Virginia Stapleton with us. She was having a little bit of technical difficulty getting in the room, so she would have been here earlier. But she is with us now, and she is here at, uh, for Councillor Kayser. So welcome. Thank you, Chris. And do we have any other questions uh, for Ms. Utes or comments on the information reports? All right, seeing none and seeing no further business on our agenda, the Housing Authority is adjourned. Thank you. I'm going to call this uh, meeting of the City of Salem Urban Renewal Agency for Monday, August 24th to order. Order, would you please call the roll? Board Member Kayser, absent. Board Member Anderson? Present. Board Member Nanke? Here. Board Member Leung? Here. Board Member Osik? Here. Board Member Hoy? Here. Board Member Nordyke? Here. Board Member Lewis? Here. Chair Bennett. Here. Thank you. See any additions or deletions? No. Okay. Uh, Councilor Hoy, the consent calendar. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Second by Nordyke. Okay. Yep. We have item 3.1A, which are the July 27, 2020 draft urban renewal agency minutes. And that concludes the consent calendar. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, reporter, please call the roll. Board Member Nordyke? Aye. Board Member Lewis? Aye. Board Member Leung? Aye. Board Member Anderson? Aye. Board Member Nanke? Board Member Kayser absent. Board Member Osik? Aye. Board Member Hoy? Aye. Chair Bennett? Aye. Thank you. Passes. I do not see any further business. We're adjourned. Call this meeting of the Salem City Council for Monday, August 24th to order. If the uh, recorder would please call the roll. Councillor Kayser, absent. Councillor Anderson? Present. Councillor Nanke? Here. Councillor Leung? Here. Councillor Osik? Here. Councillor Hoy? Here. Councillor Nordyke? Here. Councillor Lewis? Here. Mayor Bennett? Here. Thank you. I, I want to welcome uh, guest counselor and counselor elect uh, Virginia Stapleton. Virginia, good to see you. It's good to see you too. Thank you for being here. All righty. Additions and deletions. I move additions and deletions to the agenda. Second. Second by Anderson. Item 3.3A, we have uh, attachments added to the uh, Broadway Street Northeast at Pine Street Northeast Signal Street and intersection improvements. Okay. Any discussion on that? Although uh, we'll have the recorder call a roll on those additions and deletions. Councillor Lewis? Aye. Councillor Kayser, absent. Councillor Anderson? Aye. Councillor Nanke? Aye. Councillor Leung? Here, uh, aye. Councillor Osik? Aye. 
Councillor Hoy? Aye. Councillor Nordyke? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, any councillor comments this evening? Councillor Hoy? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to speak about a couple of items tonight. Uh, first uh, is the COVID crisis. We're about six months into this thing and understandably people are getting tired of how it's impacting our lives. It's challenging everything about how we live our lives and how we conduct our business. I've had family and friends contract the illness and believe me, it's very real. But this is not the time to give up on the fight or to become complacent and we each have to do our part to get on the other side of this thing. I was speaking with Councillor uh, Trevor Phillips this weekend about this, and he was adamant that we have not seen the worst of this thing yet if we don't all wear masks and socially distance ourselves. This means whenever we're outside, anytime we're outside of our house, uh, where you might possibly encounter people, whether it's in the park, on the sidewalk, or wherever, wear your mask. Don't wait until you see someone. It's probably too late then. Just wear your mask, mask and keep your distance. We can get through this but we all have to do our part. The governor has indicated if we don't lower the numbers, businesses will close and we can't let that happen. We need to wear our masks and we need to encourage others to wear their masks as well. And I just thank everybody for listening uh, and doing your part uh, and reminding others to wear their masks. It's, a, it's an inconvenience, but it's a very small inconvenience in the grand scheme of things. I also wanna talk about uh, one other situation uh, we've had yet another shooting of another unarmed black man in this country, this, this time in Wisconsin. As a retired law enforcement officer of 30 years, I'm sickened. I'm sickened. I'm also hearing reports that there have been incidents of violence against peaceful protesters locally. This has to stop. Everyone in our community deserves a voice and they deserve to be heard. We are long past the time when voices will be silenced. We have to call it out when we see it and we all need to stand up and be heard. Black lives matter. They matter here in Salem and they matter in Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just to second your comments uh, on COVID. Uh, I just before the meeting, I was on a, a conference call with the governor and uh, she drove home the message you also uh, shared, Councillor Hoy, that we really need to up our game. And I'm going to have the city manager speak about this in a few minutes, but. Uh, uh, this is very important if we want to keep uh, our restaurants, the bars, uh, and ultimately, probably the most important, get our schools back open, get kids back in school. This, this is no, this is kind of an all hands on deck with a mask on. Uh, people are going to have to get very, very serious about that social distancing, washing their hands. It's kind of like we're starting over again, but let's not go back to a shutdown and start from there again. So I, I just can't support enough what you've had to say. Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would third what Councillor Hoy and you have said, Mr. Mayor, and that was one of my, I was going to be one of my comments. And as you know, in the past, I've come on with a mask and, and said, you ought to wear a mask and it's easy. And the vast majority of people do, but we need better compliance. And it's just gonna make things worse and as I said before, it's not a matter, matter of your personal freedom to not wear a mask. It's a matter of your standing as a member of society who should be concerned for everybody in, in the group. Then I want to second what uh, I was also going to speak to the same points that Councillor Hoy raised about what happened in Kenosha. It's, it, it's beyond disgusting. And we do not seem to have learned as a society, and that's very disturbing to me. Same thing is true in Portland, and I would add a little bit more to that in that, you know, I don't know if this is true, but it seems like the Portland police are not doing anything to discourage actual physical violence be between people on either, um, groups on either side of the situation. Uh, and finally, uh, this is uh, the comment that nobody else has made, but it relates in many ways to what we've been talking about the, the unrest in our country. Uh, I know Councillor Hoy has, uh, uh, will have on the future agenda the discussion of renaming of Center Street uh, and the bridge for uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
and I've been thinking about this, and uh, I think another thing we ought to look at, and I will be making either an amendment or bringing a separate motion, is we have something outside the Salem City Hall called the Salem Peace Plaza. It's between the library and City Hall itself. And we uh, have recently lost a giant, another giant in the civil rights movement who his whole uh, persona and his whole message was we can do these things peacefully. And that was Congressman John Lewis. So uh, I'm going to be proposing that the Peace Plaza be named the John Lewis Peace Plaza between the library and the city council to give us a reminder of what this person stood for and, and what we should all stand for. Very good, thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, Councillor Stapleton. I love that all three women raised their hand at the same time. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to take a minute to um, thank Councillor Hoy for his words and um, second them as well. Also just say it's an honor to be here today and um, I'm really looking forward to working with you all in the future and want to send um, thank you to uh, Councillor Kayser for her work uh, for the last four years um, and she's become a great friend and a mentor to me and um, it's an honor to uh, be stepping into her shoes. Um, so thank you so much for having me tonight. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nordyke. Thank you, Mayor. So my colleagues have already said it better than I could at this point about the ongoing unrest in our country and the need to treat all lives with dignity, but especially given the fact that Black Lives Matter and it's extremely upsetting to see yet again that we see ongoing violence and unrest in other parts of the country. And here at home, I think we need to do as good of a job as we possibly can to recognize a need for having peaceful protests and that, you know, it doesn't serve any advantage to let protesters duke it out. I think that that creates opportunities for retaliation. It creates opportunity for escalation. And so everyone needs to be recognized for their ability to rec serve their constitutional rights of peaceful protest. So I 100% agree and echo the comments y'all have already made already. Uh, two other points that I want to make also is that amidst all of the financial strain that's been caused by COVID-19 is we have a wave of evictions that is likely coming. And when I joined council, we had a crisis of homelessness and that crisis continues. While the headlines are being dominated by other worthy topics, that doesn't mean that the homelessness crisis is gone. And so something that I see absent in our agenda this evening, but I would like to see discussed in the near future at our next council meeting would be a discussion with staff and perhaps with some of our homeless service providers in the area on what our plan is for this upcoming winter. I don't think anyone would like to see a repeat of last winter. And I think that we need to start working on a plan. And I recognize that every day city staff are working behind the scenes to put folks in affordable housing, to connect them with services, to provide opportunities to incentivize positive behavior through cash or trash and other programs. So on the one hand, I recognize that every day city staff are uh, army of volunteers, either volunteering through city committees or volunteering through the network of private and nonprofit charities around the city. These folks every day are working to support our homeless community, but our community also needs to see leadership from council and they need to see what are we doing in terms of preventing a repeat of last winter. So I would really like to ask city staff to come prepared to share with us what we're going to do to do a better job this winter of working with our persons who are unsheltered. I know that we've extended the camping ban and I think that will provide some relief, but that provides some challenges as well. So the sooner we start talking about it, the sooner we, be, we will be prepared. You either fail to plan or plan to fail. So I think that's really important. Uh, last but not least, I know that in the future, we are going to have a climate action task force. And I look forward to opportunities to work with our task force on that because that too continues unabated. 
uh, 2020 is an unbelievable year and we have so many challenges layered on top of each other. And I look forward to working with our community on all those things as this unforgettable year unfolds. And that's really the nicest word that I can think of when I think of 2020. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor Leo. Thank you. Um, so without making myself sound like a broken record, even though I will, <laughs> um, I really hope that um, folks out there will continue to follow the guidance issued by the state on protecting one another, specifically from the harms of COVID-19. Please wear a mask and follow rules to maintain social distancing. Um, COVID-19 has uh, personally infected uh, my family. Um, I had a relative who passed away last month who was elderly, but they were healthy. They didn't have any underlying conditions. There are also cases throughout the nation of children from infants to teenagers who've died. Um, I'm also aware of local uh, community members that I do a lot of work within um, who had, had now health issues resulting from COVID. One person who was healthy in their 30s had a stroke and the doctor determined that that was caused by co the, the complications from COVID-19. So please take COVID-19 seriously. Now, as a public health professional, I am concerned and I hope people will take the necessary steps to protect not only themselves, but also vulnerable community members. Um, second, I am also concerned about the pain and the recent violence that has continued to occur um, within our, our Black community, um, specifically uh, over what happened on, on, over the weekend on Saturday. It happened on Capitol Steps. This violence must stop. Our community is hurting. We need to be able to care for one another. This includes amplifying the concerns and lived experience of our Black community. We're continuing to witness violence. We need to be able to call it out and we need to ensure that we protect and care for one another. Please know this is about protecting our community from systemic, systematic oppression and racism that's, uh, that's throughout. Um, we must be able to work together. We must be able to show up. This means being accountable. And, you know, we were elected to serve this community. We need to make sure that we're being held accountable to that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. City Manager. Thank you. Uh, as the mayor uh, shared earlier, Governor Brown, in addition to a press conference on Friday and meeting with county elected leadership, met with city elected leadership today and is really, as has been said, is really uh, urging us all to continue and in many ways improve our efforts to, uh, to uh, stop the spread of, of, of this virus. Uh, masks, face shields, and face coverings are currently required statewide for offices and indoor public spaces and in outdoor spaces, public spaces when physical distancing of six feet is not possible. The city will be increasing our messaging regarding the importance of wearing masks. We need to set an example by wearing masks and providing information. I've asked our police, parks, and code enforcement staff to provide reminders and masks to the public with whom they interact. Specific city reminder opportunities include police interaction with the public, park ranger interaction with park users and groups, code enforcement, parks and public works staff when providing program information and reservations. The city recently received 20,000 masks from our sister city Gim Hay, uh, South Korea. So we have a supply of masks to share with the community. So there's no excuse for not wearing a mask. OSHA remains the single point of contact for reports of businesses or individuals who refuse to comply. We will have a page on the city's website that points the public in the direction of OSHA. Should they want to make a complaint a perceived violation. In cases where the refusal to comply is egregious or where non-compliance includes other law violations, our police officers retain discretion to determine whether issuance of a citation is appropriate. Chronic violations and significant incidents will be handled case by case by the Salem Police Department. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manager. All right, we'll move on then. The 
consent calendar, Councillor Hoy. Did you want to do public comment first? No. Nope. Okay. I move approval of the consent calendar. Second. Second by Lewis. We have item 3.1A, August 10th, 2020, Draft City Council Minutes. Item 3.2A, Fiscal Year 2021, Supplemental Budget 1 for Additional COVID-19 Emergency Business Assistance Grant Expense for the General Fund. Item 3.3B, authorizes the City Manager to accept two, 238000 and execute a contract with the Business Oregon to offer additional COVID grants to small business in the City of Salem. Item 3.3C, application for project funding under the Oregon Department of Transportation Safe Route Schools Infrastructure Program. Item 3.3D, order for City Council review of the Planning Administrator's decision affirming Class 3 Site Plan Review, case number SBR 20-19 for a property located at 725 Market Street Northeast. And item 3.3A has been pulled from the consent calendar by Councilor Anderson. That concludes the consent agenda. All righty. Any discussion? Yes, just briefly. Yes, go ahead. So I intend to recuse myself from discussion of 3.3D. Do I need to not participate in the vote just for approving the consent calendar? Why don't you record? I, I, well, we better, let's call on city attorney. What would you like the counselor? The recorder can register an abstention for counselor Nordag for 3.3D. Thank you. Duly noted. All right. Uh, all if you if the recorder would please call the roll on the uh, rest of the consent calendar. Councilor Kayser absent. Councilor Anderson. Aye. Councilor Nanke. Aye. Councilor Leung. Um, I accept. Um, can I say nay for three point three A and three point three D, please? Yes. Councilor Osik. Aye. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Abstain. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Motion passes. Okay, we'll go to our public hearing. Public hearing. The City Council will now conduct a public hearing for the purpose of considering the engrossment and adoption of Ordinance Bill Number 8-20, an ordinance amending Chapter 70, Utilities, Chapter 71, Stormwater, and Chapter 601, Floodplain Overlay Zone of the Salem Revised Code. The criteria applicable to the proposed amendments are set forth in Salem Revised Code Chapter 110. Testimony must be directed toward the identified criteria or other criteria the person believes to apply to the decision. The hearing will be conducted with the staff presentation first, followed by other interested persons. Neighborhood associations are limited to five minutes per association for testimony, and individuals testifying are limited to three minutes. Hey, who's, who's up on this? I'm up. I'm, good evening, Mayor Bennett and Councilors. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, this is... Uh, this is Glenn Davis. I'm the Chief Development Engineer and Floodplain Administrator for the Public Works Department. And um, in order to explain why we're proposing Engrossed Ordinance Bill 820, I need to give some background about floodplain management and uh, the community rating system. Let's see if our screen's working here. There. So the, the federal government administers the National Flood Insurance Program called the NFIP. And most cities and counties and tribes nationwide participate in the NFIP, over 22,000 communities in all. And the NFIP sets minimum federal standards that communities need to meet, and they cannot obtain federal loans, uh, disaster funding, or flood insurance unless they participate in the NFIP. And uh, within the NFIP is a voluntary incentive program with, that's called the Community Rating System, or CRS, and kind of like the honors program within the NFIP. Once you participate, are given credit points in areas where the community exceeds minimum standards. And the incentive 
provided to the community comes through discounts in the flood insurance premiums. And the better your score in the program, the higher your flood insurance discounts. So Salem first joined the CRS in 2008 as a class eight community. And so the incentive in that point was a 10% reduction in all of Salem's flood insurance premiums. And so we've continued to improve over the years to a class five, noting that class numbers get lower as the scores improve. And class five is a 25% discount, and that is the highest CRS score in Oregon. And we share that with two other Oregon cities. So we're scheduled for a CRS reef certification audit in December of this year and are targeting a class three rating. And there's no guarantee for that, uh, but the initial signs look promising. And if we're successful, then flood insurance discounts are reduced. Uh, would, uh, the reduction would, would increase to 35%. So you may wonder, uh, is, this, is all this work, effort worth the trouble? Uh, well, right now as a class five community, Salem residents save a total of about $325,000 a year or $332 for each flood insurance policy. And if we're successful in improving to a class three, we'd increase our savings to $450,000 a year or $463 per flood insurance policy. So not only are the benefits significant, but the costs to the community are actually quite small. Um, I've led this program for about 15 years uh, and it's a small part of what I do and Robin Dahlke is another floodplain manager who assists in this program, and she has many other job assignments as well. And so between the two of us and a few others, we spend less than one total uh, full-time equivalent employee on the program. Um, so it's mostly all positives and very few negatives. And the beauty about CRS is that we can get credit for activities that we're already doing or that we want to do anyways. Um, we get credit for things like a floodplain management plan, and the action items in that plan. Uh, we get credit for a stormwater master plan, uh, which is actually being updated and will come to council for adoption next month. Other activities include public information, higher, higher standards, a flood warning system, and stormwater operations and maintenance. So those are the programs that we have that we already do that we get credit for for CRS. And I'd like to point out uh, briefly that we actually have a world-class floodplain management program. And uh, because CRS uses a scoring system, we can somewhat measure the effectiveness of our program with the scoring system they use. And so I'm going to show a few pie charts to illustrate uh, really how, how excellent our program is. So on the screen, we see a pie chart. And then this pie chart represents 22,000 NFIP communities. And of those on the chart, only 7% participate in CRS, uh, shown in that little slice in orange. So the blue area in the chart represents the non-CRS communities on this first pie chart. So now I'm gonna take that wedge, that orange wedge of the pie chart and expand it into a new pie chart that it represents the 1600 CRS communities uh, where the blue chart represents the 22,000. So uh, we see that 91% of those communities are uh, greater than class five, 9% are less than class five or equal is that yellow wedge. So now the yellow wedge is the ones that are rated class one through five in the CRS program. And Salem is in that yellow wedge. And then lastly, I'll show a third pie chart, which is now that yellow wedge into another pie chart showing the 150 communities that are within uh, class one through five. 130 of them are, uh, are class five, which is in the yellow there are less than 20 communities that have reached anything less than class five. And those are shown in the multicolored wedge on the pie chart. So um, one of the reasons for that is that up to class five, there's flexibility as to what you choose to do to get scores to improve your, your rating. But at class four, there's mandatory prerequisites that all people better than class five have to meet without exception. So uh, that's one of the reasons why it's hard to get to class four and better. So our first pie chart was 22,000 communities. Our second chart was 1,600 CRS uh, participants. Our third pie chart is 150 communities that scored class five or better. So that puts us among the top 12 of 20,000 communities. Uh, so our, our Salem program has a world-class floodplain management program, period.
Um, that's not just because of one or two people. It's a result of dozens of city staff who do great work every day. It's because of this council and previous councils who have provided bipartisan support to our good floodplain management. And this program is why we're proposing engrossed ordinance 820. So now uh, to the ordinance itself, uh, it's required to meet some of these CRS prerequisites to get beyond class five. The primary issue being resolved is a requirement that we have a regulatory limit regarding flows from larger storms. Uh, and I wanna make a couple of points of clarification here. Uh, first is this is something we wanna do anyways. So there's not really a negative impact here. Second, I should mention that our, our current regulations already limit flows from all storms. But currently we, we accomplish this goal by requiring the stormwater facilities use green stormwater infrastructure or GSI. Uh, the current regulations are more specific for flow control of smaller storms and more general regarding flow control of larger storms. So this new ordinance requires the facilities are engineered very specifically for both smaller and larger storms. Secondary issue being resolved in this ordinance is a Scrivener's error in Chapter 601, our floodplain overlay zone. The error has to do with elevating utility systems and new buildings, uh, and this change is required to meet the mandatory CRS prerequisites that we intended to have fixed last year. Uh, other changes uh, include um, minor changes not related to the CRS. We have modified a couple definitions in order to address some un intended problems administering uh, the stormwater code in particular that we've noticed over time. We've also made a change regarding downstream analysis. Uh, we're putting greater limitation on stormwater flows uh, to meet the prerequisite. And so now there's no justification for a downstream analysis because there is no impact. And I don't wanna make sure that this is not confused with SDCs. Developments still pay SDCs and those SDC funds are intended to address major capacity problems in individual projects though won't be analyzed uh, individually and so lastly i'll mention that the ordinance was engrossed uh, because the citizen discovered a typo where the ordinance said 20 instead of 25. so staff recommends that council forward the ordinance to second reading for adoption and that concludes my presentation Okay. Am I on right now? My turn. All right, we have, uh, sorry, we have one person uh, signed up, uh, Steve Anderson representing the West Salem Neighborhood Association. Steve. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council Members. Steve Anderson, 3240 Geller Road, Northwest Salem. I'm here tonight to offer testimony on behalf of the West Salem Neighborhood Association Executive Committee and Friends of Marine Drive. We wish to thank Mr. Davis and the public work staff for offering these amendments to SRC Chapter 71 and the related codes encourage the council to adopt the proposed amendments for two reasons. First, this adoption will assist residents and businesses situated within Salem's floodplains by lowering flood insurance rates. And second, the staff report affirms that these proposed changes conform to the city's comprehensive natural resource goal to conserve open space and protect natural resources. This is a goal we take seriously and support. We ask council in your decision to adopt the staff report as an affirm affirmation of the comp plan natural resources goals and policies. One reason is simple. The city is currently engaged in purchasing right away for the future Marine Drive just west of the Willamette floodplain in West Salem. Marine Drive, in addition to providing needed connectivity in West Salem, will serve as a boundary between the urban landscape and the natural areas east thereof. Those pending purchases include portions of the floodplain and historical natural ecosystems in that purchase process. We encourage the city to formally identify the floodplain properties as natural areas, thus supporting the city's comp plan goal to conserve open space and protect natural resource area. We think this is a good amendment and support it 100%. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Any questions for Mr. Anderson? 
Right, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Davis? Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First, Mr. Davis, I really want to congratulate you. Uh, I was here at least in 2016 when that happened, and this is a terrific thing that will be saving um, money for uh, the citizens of Salem or in the floodplain, but also saving money for the city in general with, when we have to deal with these issues. Here's my question, uh, uh, Glenn. I'm looking at no, uh, pages three, bottom of three and the top of four, where you talk about uh, uh, how many um, uh, lots might be lost from a subdivision, a typical subdivision, which is very, very small, and how many parking spaces might be lost from um, commercial or industrial building sites, which again is very, very small when you look at the overall picture. I guess this is more of a technical scientific question. When more built up lots or more built parking spaces, that creates more surface runoff, which contributes to floodplain problems? Um, well, the, the uh, boy, that, that's, a, that's a, let me make sure I understand the question. Okay. So yeah, the, the, the impervious surface is what causes additional runoff. Exactly yeah. right, exactly right. Okay, yeah, so, so, um, uh, by doing this, not only are we looking at the whole flood, the floods in general, the floods, but also in general, we have met less uh, uh, surface runoff from uh, impervious surfaces because they won't be built over or used as parking spaces. And, and have uh, more volume for their flow control as well. Okay, good, 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 thanks. That's a very good job. I. I'm not an engineer, but I've spent enough time with you, Glenn, to know that you could answer that question. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Councillor Lewis. Uh, yeah, Glenn, I, I do want to congratulate you and the staff. Um, you know, this sets Salem out and I, uh, saving 25% is a, is a huge amount, especially for those folks that are now getting hit with those insurance bills. Um, I guess I have a comment and then a question. It, it's the same issue that is closing the Glen Creek apartments, um, the redoing of the maps and, and identifying properties in a flood in a flood zone that, you know, I, I agree with Ms. Utes. Um, I don't think these apartments are in a flood zone, but because the map says they are, HUD won't allow them to be used for low income. My question is, and this may be for Director Fernandez, um, in reading the comments from the uh, West Salem Neighborhood Association Executive Committee, um, I'm just curious if this passes tonight, does this affect in any way the ability of the city to move forward with Marine Drive as is now depicted in the Salem Transportation Plan? Uh, I can speak. Th this change would have no effect on that. So um, I'll defer to Peter for anything more than that the answer thank you any other questions okay Let's see if there's any well okay why don't we just uh, close that public hearing we don't have all the different parties we would have on some other public hearings. So that uh, public hearings closed. Councilor Hoy. Thank you, motion. Mr. Mayor. I move we engross ordinance bill number 8-20 amending chapter 70 utilities, chapter 71 stormwater, and chapter 601 floodplain overlay zone of the Salem Reserve revised code and advance to second reading. Second. Second by Lewis. Any discussion? Okay. The recorder would please call the roll. Councilor Anderson? Aye. Councilor Nanke? Aye. Councilor Leung? Aye. Councilor Osick? Aye. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor Kayser, absent. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Motion passes. Move on then. Special orders of business, 3.3a, Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
I move the staff recommendation without the inclusion of the northbound right turn lane at Broadway and uh, Pine. Second. Second by Osik. All right. You want to discuss your motion, or do you think it's self-explanatory? Well, it's a little bit self-explanatory, but you don't mean, Mr. Mayor. I got to, you know. I, I want you to get it all in. Opportunity. Um, I'll try to be brief because I think we've gotten a lot of information. Uh, uh, I would just, uh, I would clearly adopt uh, the arguments made by the O'Berry family, both before last meeting and this meeting, especially when you look at what Mr. Overy said about the, the traffic counts uh, get it peaking in 99 and going lower. Um, I have uh, uh, also Bob Courtright who wrote a nice email today. I just wanna say that I've got micro and macro objections to the turn lane. The macro objection is climate change, preference for autos over people, concern about pressure to the driver who wants to hurry a turn, Overbuilding to maximum capacity for one peak hour, which we've heard that argument before. The micro argument is all of the above plus concerns with neighborhood north of the market and hood, which is primarily residential. I'm not concerned about the bus stops because the bus stops stop on, on Broadway and other places without a fourth lane. Uh, concerned about small businesses, uh, inconsistencies with our adopting a, a climate um, um, action plan and uh, the peak traffic going down, which is all I already said. It just doesn't seem like there's a lot of bang for a buck with this, um, especially when uh, you look at uh, um, the fact that only, uh, oh gosh, 71 cars, I think, are turning uh, uh, right at the peak hour. Um, you know, I have some more comments that I'll ask the questions I'll ask the staff, but I just think this is the way to go. The street diet is a good thing. Uh, right turn lane isn't. Are you at all troubled that we voted for this two years ago? Did that? Uh, no, I'm not because okay. it was the transportation safe. It was the trans TSP. It was a safety thing, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, transportation system plan, excuse me, Mr. Mayor. You know, which is a general thing that it's hard to get down to the individual details. Okay. We got it now, and I look at this and I say, uh, street diet is great, but right turn lane for a whole lot of reasons is not great. Okay. I just wondered because that was something that caught my attention. I just wondered how how you fit that together. Um, anyone else want to discuss this, or do you want to hear Peter Fernandez discuss it a little bit? People's hand up. Officer Hoy, is your hand up? Yes. Yes. I actually had a question for Mr. Fernandez. Um, I was surprised to read in the staff report that uh, one of the purposes of that right-hand turn lane would be for the buses to pull out and to make to make that turn. Because I remember specifically when I was on the uh, the transit committee, because I always thought that those pullouts for buses were a great thing because they let traffic flow by when the and while passengers are loading and unloading. But the transit district, chariots, they feel very differently about that. And they actually asked us not to create those because buses can't get back into traffic. So I was a little bit surprised to see that in the, the staff report as a reason when we had been told specifically not to do those. So I was just curious about that. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Hoy. Uh, we spoke with uh, transit district staff uh, late last week and they said that uh, they actually would prefer to service the intersection on the near side rather than the far side. What they would like to see is what's called the Q jump. So when the signal turns and we'd be able to time the signal. So when the signal turned, the bus would be able to go first. And that's the difference between that situation where they'd be able to, to uh, go ahead of the queued traffic rather than a, in a pullout bus stop situation. Thank you. And that's that's another element that we had discussed during that committee. So that that makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Fernandez, help me out on that right turn. Does that make it safer for pedestrians? It all it sounds like it might make it more difficult for pedestrians and bicyclists in those bike lanes if the right turn lane is there. 
I, I see it on 17th and Center Street, which is a route that I use quite a bit, uh, where pro stacking does occur because of pedestrians and people are kind of rushing them. I, I want to understand the safety factor. Sure. So the whole project, Mayor, is a safety project, and we don't, uh, uh, you know, we don't install things lightly. Uh, so we think these things through. Uh, what the turn lane does is uh, is allows right turners uh, to come to a stop if they're if somebody has pressed the button to cross Pine Street, which is where the right turn lane would uh, would conflict with the pedestrians. Then that right turn lane would get a red uh, a red arrow, so it would make it easier to cross the street north south. Uh, as opposed to when you're in the travel lane, what you have is a green ball. So you have to come up, come to a stop and wait for the peds. We see situations like that. Uh, you mentioned 17th Street. So 17th and Center, 17th and State are two locations, especially headed northbound, where we get a lot of pedestrian activity. So uh, a lot of traffic queues up waiting for that, for that uh, right turn traffic to uh, waiting for the pedestrian. What we're concerned about at this location is Spruce Street is just a block south. So if we get more backups, it's very easy for then traffic to cut through Spruce and then hit either Winter or Maple or some of the other streets, as opposed to staying in the minor arterial, which is where we want them. Uh, we just got a, uh, an email last week from a resident of that neighborhood uh, concerned about the Maple Street work that we've done where traffic is now being uh, diverted. And uh, she commented that she wanted to make sure that she wasn't commenting on this issue, but she was commenting in general at the intersection that she wanted to see the intersection of Broadway and Pine continue to operate efficiently so that they don't get cut through traffic in their neighborhood. I, I want again on this safety question, on this question. So I am a pedestrian uh, going to cross Pine Street, uh, at Broadway and Pine. And I will I push a button and it will cause the arrow to or the, the light to go red for a driver. Do we have any place else that does that in town? Did I understand? Uh, sure. Any, any place that has a right turn lane controlled by a signal. What uh, about what about uh, front and uh, court? We've that's been somewhat controversial that crossing. Uh, there's been quite a bit of stacking on court. There was some talk about removing that crossing. Yeah. Does that have that kind of feature? It does not. Okay. So what we get, what do we get when that happens? I, I watch behavior that makes me very uncomfortable where people rush pedestrians trying to cross, you know, the light's green. I see the driver is looking at a green light and a pedestrian crossing. They're, they get pretty antsy about getting as close to that pedestrian as they can. I'm thinking of other spots here in town where that happens. Where where do we see this in action? Where could we have seen this work? Uh, you mean the right turn lane? Or the right or the turn where the light, the light for the right turner goes red. Yeah. The arrow uh, goes red for the... I think Kevin Hockman is on the call, so maybe he can give me a hand here if he can... Come on and good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. Uh, Kevin Hopman, City Traffic Engineer. Uh, we just uh, added a right turn protected ped phase to Lancaster at Ricky. So that, okay. that is a very heavy uh, right turn lane um, when you're westbound to go north on Lancaster yeah. uh, past the, the Space Age gas station. So we did that. So basically, when a pedestrian pushes, the button we have the ability to not serve it as a protected or an arrow uh, we also use um, the protected ped phases a lot with the flashing yellow signals um, so around schools we started it a number of years ago when people were pushing the buttons we don't give a left turn phase where somebody would try to cut across the pedestrian crossing so it's an option that we have well, does this also that. eliminate does this also eliminate potential conflict between a bicyclist in the bicycle lane i mean we're we're doing this road diet for in part for pedestrians and bicyclists will this also help the bicyclists moving along in terms of their safety and not having someone turn into them off of broadway yeah go ahead kevin um the but the uh what will happen with bicyclists is having a right turn lane the uh, the vehicle and bicycle the 
the uh, vehicle uh, shifts through the bike lane prior to getting to the intersection. So um, the driver isn't um, looking at other things in the intersection. Sort of like center and church, kind of, that, that look yeah. up by the ch old Chase Bank there at the, you know where I'm thinking of? Uh, well, any, any place we have a right turn lane, we merge, uh, we merge the right turns prior, yeah. And so uh, what this prevents is the, the right hook, um, which is where the bike's coming up and the car's turning right at an intersection and making a, a 90 degree turn. So it, it's the bike, the, the car with the right turn lane, the car is merging past the bikes. It's not the bikes crossing uh, the vehicle path, so. Is this, uh, we're doing the road diet, is this part of the underlying planning for these kinds of road diets? Because we're looking at another on State Street. Uh, I assume we'll be looking at, at some of the other uh, four lane streets where we want to go down to three uh, center left and a uh, a right on arterials is that going to be the standard for these well we we look at all of them individually so we okay. would have a traffic study done to see what the movements were and if we were having uh conflicts or the study determined that it was needed then we would definitely consider it who did the study on this one uh, i had help from a, a citizen uh, when they first uh, asked about the road diet and, and who did the traffic study where Tom, Tom mentioned the 70 cars a day or I, at, at peak hours? What, when was that? Yeah, yeah, Gary did it for the Gary. original. Yeah. Gary Overy? Yes. He did the study. In the okay, beginning. thanks. Councillor Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've got a couple of questions for, uh, I think, Mr. Hot Hotman now that he's here. Um, Kevin, as I read this, and I'm looking at uh, question number five of about the 22 questions you ask, and I'm sorry to say, or I don't know if I'm sorry or proud to say, 90% of those questions were my questions that I said I would ask. Um, <laughs> it looks to me like uh, this is the discussion of the peak hours. So what we're talking about is a peak hour in the morning and a peak hour in the afternoon. Is that correct? That's an hour? Correct. And then the traffic count in the morning by my count is 438 cars going through that intersection northbound. Is that correct? Okay, yeah, I, whatever I had, yeah, yeah my response. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's well below the capacity for that intersection, isn't it? It, uh, I mean, capacity depends on a lot of stuff, but okay, let's look at 90% volume to capacity. Yeah, the, the, the V over C is less than capacity, yes. Okay, then on the evening, uh, going northbound, 781 cars again, that's just your figure on uh, uh, go, go through that intersection going northbound. That's still below the 90% volume to capacity, isn't it? Correct. Okay, and of that. Only 7% or, excuse me, 56 cars make a right-hand turn. That's what Yeah, what the counts, okay. yeah, that for that count. Okay, and even, I, I can't remember if I asked you this, but even 781 is below the capacity for the interstate. Correct. Okay, then I'm a little curious about number 22, and Director Fernandez talked about this a little bit in terms of, well, what are we going to do about cars at Spruce and people cutting through the neighborhood and that sort of stuff. Um, one of the concerns, and this is not my question, it's clearly an engineer's question, um, that the northbound flow along Broadway is constrained by Hood and Market Streets because there's a, uh, the heavy conflicting flows, you turn that way. And I think you agreed with that because your answer is the downstream intersections are, are a large factor in the amount of northbound traffic. Correct. So, so, but your answer then goes on to say, but all these cars are coming in from side streets. There's only about four or five side streets there, aren't there? Yeah, and one of them is a collector, so a busier street. Yeah, but the rest of them are residential streets. Yes. Okay, and despite the cars coming in at north, uh, 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 at the peak hour in the north, there's only 50, 56 going north that turn right. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, I rode my bicycle out there today uh, just to look at it. And um, I, I, I do have, and this is more of a comment than a question, but maybe you can comment on it. I feel the same danger when, when the traffic is, is, is crossing my bike lane to get into the right turn lane, wherever it is. So it may not be the right hook that you get in a, at, the, at the actual intersection, but I'm getting a, worried about a right jab when, I, when in, anytime any car crosses my lane. I look just as soon as the, the bike lane lines become, um, what do you call it, broken lines, Skipped. so cars can cross them. Anytime a car crosses a bike lane, I'm worried. So when I was dry, riding my bike up Broadway today, when I got to that line, I'm looking behind at the cars to look at, are they signaling, are they not signaling, what are the wheels doing? I look at that there just like a look at, at the intersection. So wouldn't you agree that there still is a danger to a bicyclist whether it's you know 80 feet or 100 feet back from the intersection or at the intersection yeah i mean any time a vehicles cross or heads cross yeah okay okay um that's basically all i have thanks kevin for the work you do for the city and and i know you just want to be an engineer and <laughs> and uh you know that's peter's job about the about the more of the policy issues but thanks a lot for coming yeah, thank you you know councilor answer I, anderson i think there was um you know since we want to get into nerdy professional traffic engineer items this this volume to capacity this capacity of the roadway and then the number of volume uh, the volume of traffic is is correct i mean obviously you you've been studying up and and i appreciate that because that's only the best people love that kind of stuff you know, one factor that isn't included in that VC ratio, that kind of analysis, is the number of pedestrians. Yeah. And we don't really have a count. We know that there's a lot of pedestrians. We know that that's inside of a school zone. So so really, as the, as the volume of pedestrians on that east side of that east leg of the intersection is increasing, regardless of the number of right turns, they are now stopped. There's not, it's not a free flow situation. So I think that's an important factor that we don't have the data for, but I think we, we shouldn't forget that factor. And that's part of the reasoning for uh, uh, this right turn lane. That's, that's the issues that we're seeing as we were talking about the example at 17th at State and 17th at, at, uh, at Center is as pedestrian uh, volumes are increasing, that's where the need for the right turn lane starts to show up. And Director Fernandez, thanks for that. But I also, uh, talking about volumes increasing, it seems to me that one of the basis for this is that the uh, it's Public Works conclusion that we're going to have increased traffic rather than decreased traffic. And yeah. how does that, it doesn't seem like that jives with the figures provided by Mr. Overy from his counts, who's a professional engineer and a traffic engineer. He says they've been going down for the last yeah. 21 years. We looked at, Mr. Overy works at ODOT, we looked at, uh, at ODOT data uh, community-wide. So we don't do, we just don't have the, 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 the capacity, the, the, the resources to do annual counts everywhere. To dig down that deep. Yeah. So, so we do do, uh, ODOT does do annual counts at, at the bridges, at a number of other locations, and we pulled that information today. And there's been a lot of dips. There was a big dip in traffic uh, in, uh, after the recession in 2007. And then it started to rise again. And then, interestingly enough, there was another dip in 2010, 2011, and it dipped for a while. Since 2013, traffic has been increasing and, in fact, has been increasing pretty dramatically. Now, again, these are at, at the bridges and at other locations, not at Broadway specifically because we don't have that information. But we are seeing a steady increase in traffic. And we, that was one of the questions, and we did speak to uh, the issue that traffic can be very variable. Uh, so I would not count as, as our uh, community continues to grow and we continue, we're blessed with a UGB, which means we're, gonna de we're densifying inside of, of, of the urban area. Uh, I think we're going to continue to see uh, traffic volumes increase. We'll see these dives, but we, had, we have a situation where it's increased pretty steadily since 2013 to now. So, so I, I understand what Mr. Ubery has provided, and it's, it's true. Uh, but we also are seeing increases in, in traffic volumes. One final question, if I may, Mr. Mayor, and then I see Lewis and others have, uh, you know, I look at this and, and it is true. We're going to, you know, assuming we're going to grow and et cetera, et cetera. 
but we've got just one or two blocks over, we've got Liberty going north. So cars that are wanting to get out of town will go Liberty, hook up on the parkway. When we're down at, at Hood Street, I think it's Hood, you take a right on Hood, you go into Fairgrounds, which becomes Portland Road. So if you want to get out of town that way, you can get out. So it seems to me that in any kind of increase, Broadway is going to be a street that affects the neighborhood much more than cars coming through with a big hurry to get through because they can go over one or two blocks to Liberty or cut off a hood and go to uh, uh, go to um, Fairgrounds Road and then Portland Road. Right, um, and that's that's certainly where that's certainly where we want traffic and yeah, yeah. the signals timed and everything for for Liberty. This project is not to induce more traffic on Broadway, but to create safety at that intersection for, for the motorists, for the pedestrians, for the bicyclists. So I'll take your answer, but go ahead. I'm, I'm done, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Councillor uh, Lewis. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I, I just, I'll be honest, I look at this a little bit differently. And, and what I see we're talking about here is planning for the future. Um, there are those that insist that, uh, that our, our car count should be where it is now and never go any higher. But, but to me, that, that defies common sense. I mean, I'm looking at a screen here, and there's already a number of people who have already changed their mode of transportation to an electric car. So the idea that we're going to do away with cars, uh, I think, is not very realistic. Um, there will be increase in, in traffic as we grow, especially in the inner city area as we increase our density. I do have a question uh, and a concern about the numbers. Any, any number chart that, uh, that stops at 2013 um, it concerns me. I remember the, uh, the folks, the anti-bridge folks that were telling us in the middle of the recession, see, we don't need a bridge because the bridge counts down. You look at the bridge count now 10 years later and it's way up. And so I, I can't support the motion. I will, uh, I am going to uh, propose a substitute motion and I move staff recommendation. Second. Second by Nanke. Okay. Right, thank you. Uh, yes, Councillor Stapleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had a quick question about the pedestrian crosswalk. Um, whether or not it has a right turn lane, uh, because it is so highly used and because um, it is, uh, I believe, on the safe routes to school, um, uh, having Highland Elementary there, is there any way that we could do uh, striping on that pedestrian crosswalk um, to kind of give it a little bit more um, highlighted safety um, for those uh, crossing? And likewise, do we do anything, if we went without the turn lane, um, for a bike kind of box or a highlighted area for a bicyclist to uh, stay in when it's a red light? I guess, Council, it's good to see you, by the way. It's, it's <laughs> um, so as a signalized intersection, the uh, all, all four quadrants will be, uh, are striped and would be striped. Uh, I think what you're asking is whether it be the, the, uh, the zebra stripe. Uh, I'm not sure Kevin can hop back on to uh, let us know what the striping plan calls for at the at the intersection. Uh, in terms of the bike lane, that there is no, there are no bike lanes really on Broadway. So so this project will create bike lanes from Spruce, which is a block south, all the way to uh, uh, to Salem Parkway. And then there are bike lanes uh, north of uh, of Salem Parkway, at least for at least for a little while. So that that's the whole point of this project. Uh, whether we'd need a bike box per se, you know, would depend on volumes. If we started to see high volumes of bicyclists, then we could create a, a spot for them. But there would be that that bike lane will continue in either scenario. That bike lane will will be before the intersection continue through the intersection. Kevin, the striping for the crosswalks. Yeah, the the striping will um, we will mark it as a school crosswalk, which is the the bars. Um, all four quadrants will have the school crossing markings. Great, thank you so much. Anybody else? Okay, anyone want to discuss the substitute motion? Mr. Mayor, I had my hand up raised. Oh, I'm sorry, you're in a, you're in a little tiny picture tonight. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry, I can't so, see you. Sure, 
So I'd uh, just like to make a few comments. Um, first of all, I this is this whole discussion is a great example of why it's so great to have public comment on these discussion topics. I don't live in that part of town and it's extremely helpful to hear from folks who have a lot more experience and have seen what the traffic looks like over the years. And I do find it particularly helpful to hear from folks who say that traffic volumes peaked in 1999. And I also hear from our public works director on how, you know, how you manage traffic and how you measure traffic really does vary from all over the town. Uh, and that you can have ebb and flows that have connections to recession and other economic impacts, how other parts of town are being developed. So I find the conversation extremely helpful. Uh, the overarching comment that I want to make, because I'm not a traffic engineer, Lord knows, and I do appreciate the expertise that we receive, both from citizen engineers like Mr. Obery and our city en engineers within Peter's office. I sincerely preach all, appreciate all of your input on that. But I wanna push back on the assumption that if our population grows, that car traffic will necessarily grow in every facet of town. That's not necessarily the case. The fact that the traffic has ebbed and flowed during that time is evidence of the fact that just because our city grows doesn't mean that the number of cars automatically grows with it or that some neighborhoods become more congested. And I also want to recognize that so long as we have a car centric approach to growth and have those assumptions baked into development, that will make, that will lead to certain types of priorities and policies. The reality is that our landscape is rapidly changing now from both a financial perspective and a mindset. I talked about telecommuting when I joined council and now you see around the country that there are private companies and other places that are doing everything they can to incentivize telecommuting when it makes sense for certain types of employees. I have made clear from the get-go, it won't make sense for everybody. It doesn't make sense to have telecommuting for waitresses, for example, but it does for of the thousands of white collar employees around the city who live and work and can work pretty much anywhere with a laptop and a Wi-Fi connection and a cell phone. So I will be supporting Councillor Anderson's motion for that reason, because I think we need to start pushing back against a car-centric approach to decisions that we make in terms of development, how our roads look, and so on. Thank you. I'm just gonna just politely debate that slightly. This is a road diet plan that we're looking at here that actually is designed to improve bicycle and pedestrian traffic. So I, I think uh, calling it car centric might be an overstatement uh, and a little, a short right turn line, I don't think constitutes that. I, I'm just concerned that it be not be mischaracterized what we're really fundamentally talking about. We're looking at in other parts of town, trying to get us to a point that we can have a more equitable sharing of those roadways. And right now we're not doing that. We're putting in, we're ending up with four, five lane uh, roads and we need to be shrinking those down, but it takes a certain amount of uh, finesse to make those work. Uh, so everybody has a fair share of the, of the roadway. Okay, the vote, uh, oh, sorry, Councilor Hoy. That's all right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It was a last minute decision to, to speak. Uh, it's and it's emblematic of my uh, uh, sort of I'm not sure what to do here. I don't know which way to vote. I've listened to all the sides. I've read all the reports. Uh, I want it to be a safer intersection for pedestrians, for bikes, for cars. I, I don't know what the answer is. And so I'm, I'm a little bit torn on which way to go here. Uh, I appreciate everybody's comments. I appreciate the staff's work and, and certainly Mr. Obery's comments. Um, you know, you see those right turn lanes with the bike lane in the middle. I, when I'm riding my bike, I get a little bit nervous when I've got cars on both sides of me, frankly. Um, it's a little bit unsettling. I don't have any, cause I don't have any refuge. That's my concern when I'm on my bike. Like if I'm, if I'm in the, in the bike lane and just a, a standard bike lane and something's happening, I know I can bail off to the right. With these, 
I I don't know what you know. Where do you go if 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 you're on the bike and you got trouble and you need to find refuge? What do you do? That's my trouble with these. And I I know that there's you know studies showing they're safer in some respects. I love the idea that you don't have to worry about a car turning in front of you. That's happened to me uh, more than once uh, where I've nearly uh, been hit. And I actually down on Skyline and Kubler a couple of years ago, I actually had to ditch my bike in the middle of the intersection at, at a high rate of speed because a car turned right in front of me and I couldn't stop. Um, and so I, you know, I approach these from that sort of standpoint, and yet I also drive a car. And so I, I have mixed emotions about this whole thing, and I'm not sure I'm not sure what makes the most sense yet. So I appreciate the discussion. Thank you. Mr. Fernandez, uh, the point here, as I understand it, what we're really deciding on is an intergovernmental agreement that allows ODOT to buy this property at Josie's. Uh, for the right turn lane. If we turn this down, what happens to that? I mean, we we could decide later not to put in the right turn lane because of other changing information or developing information as this project goes ahead. Uh, this isn't a vote to build. This is a vote on how to get a hold of the property without the taxpayers of Salem paying for it. Uh, and it's actually the result of Mr. Robery's research that this is moving forward, as I understand. Right. Yeah. So I so I actually appreciate uh, Councillor Anderson's motion, which is, you know, to proceed with the IGA minus the right turn lane, and I think that's that's an important consideration. I appreciate that uh, Councillor Anderson spoke with us a couple of times, and we we made that clear that uh, the scope of of the because there's other acquisitions. You know, there's there's minor acquisitions on the north side of the street. There's we're improving the ADA ramps. We're moving some signal poles. So there's some things happening. So, so really, uh, the IGA doesn't speak. If you look through it, doesn't speak to the scope of the project at all. It's really just for services. So, so, so the the basic. Uh, in fact, if you look at the staff report, there is there's really no discussion in the recommendation about the right turn lane. So, so the staff report, I I implore you to to adopt so we can move the project along. The discussion about the right turn lane is really direction to staff as to whether you know we're going to uh, okay. proceed with the project as as proposed, or we're going to go back to ODOT and say, hey, we're doing the project but without the right turn lane. Okay, that's good. I think that's good to understand. That's what's going. On. Could we retroactively, if in five years or a couple of years of having the road diet, we see the problem develop, can we still move forward with this uh, right turn? If it, if it really is as essential as, as it may or may not be, what? Uh, sure, the, the, the difficulty, the we, we can always do things later. I mean, uh, you know, nothing okay. really, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't anticipate that in the next five years, anything's really gonna change at that corner uh, that would preclude the right turn lane or make the right turn lane more expensive. The difficulty that, that we always have, as you know, Mayor, you've been here a long time, is that there's a lack of resource. So the reality yeah. is that it, it, it probably won't be five years. Uh, if there's a problem, you know, it'll be a lot longer. We'll, we'll live with the problem a lot longer. Okay. I, I see what you're saying, but I, I, I also think your description of Councillor Anderson's motion is really important. I know Councillor Anderson would probably like to speak to it as well, is this in fact allows that project to move forward without what was determined to be an element that would be helpful, but it doesn't get rid of the bicycle, the pedestrian, the three, la the three lanes, north, south, and center, left, right. uh, moving ahead. Uh, that'd, be a, that'd be really too bad. Right, so, so let me speak to that, if I may. Uh, you know, this is the project in its totality was proposed to ODOT for funding. Uh, the uh, so we're going to have to go back to ODOT if the council votes to 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 uh, not do the right turn lane. I don't want to be overly dramatic. My my guess is that ODOT will 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 more than likely say it's okay, but there is a chance because we're changing the scope that ODOT might say we're moving on to a different project. Uh -huh. I you know uh, you know is it likely? Uh, probably not. But 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 I want to be clear that we have to go back and ask our funders if that's okay. Do you think Oberi will support us doing that? I mean, <laughs> have to he ask supported his... us doing the right turn at one point. I want to try to understand this. Thing. We'll, we'll check with Gary, see where he's at. Yeah, Councilor Anderson. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I, I appreciate this discussion too. And, and I see that it's pointed out. I'm all in favor of the project. Right. I think you know, it's good. It's it, it, I just am not in favor of the of the right turn lane for the reasons we've discussed. And it may well be, at least from my discussions on the issue, that well, first of all, the the uh, uh, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, Peter. But it seems like the lion's share of the cost here are for acquiring the right of way to do the right turn lane, for building it, for all that stuff. So sure, ODOT could say, we're giving you X dollars for this project, but now because you're not doing this, we're only gonna give you 50% of X, but that would still be enough to, co to cover the other uh, items that we've got planned. That, that would be, our, my, my guess would be that they'll fund whatever they're gonna fund for the rest of the project and just deduct Got the, it. the construction of the right of the right turn lane itself okay. if that's where okay. we're headed. Thank you, Mr. Fernandez. Okay. We sufficiently talked this one out. Everybody ready to vote? We're voting, we're on, voting on Councillor uh, Councillor Lewis's uh, substitute motion, which uh, leaves the whole project intact as it goes forward. The funding uh, mechanism and all that, it's all in place moving forward. Okay. All those in favor uh, will say aye when the recorder <laughs> calls their name, and those opposed will say no. Councilor Nanke? Aye. Councilor Leung? Nay. Councilor Osik? Nay. Councilor Hoy? Nay. Councilor Nordyke? Nay. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor Kayser absent? Councilor Anderson? No. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Okay, motion fails. So we're back to the original motion, Councillor Anderson's motion. I think we all understand what it says. I guess we understand what he's talking about. So uh, the uh, recorder would please call the roll. Councillor Leung. Aye. Councillor Osik. Aye. Councilor Hoy? Aye. Councilor Nordyke? Aye. Councilor Lewis? Aye. Councilor Kayser absent? Councilor Anderson? Aye. Councilor Nanke? Aye. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Move on ahead. Information reports. Anybody got any questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, we will move on to public comment on issues other than those on the agenda. E.M. Easterly. There he is. Good evening, Mayor Bennett and council members. I'm E.M. Easterly, Ward 8. On August 11th, I sent an email to Council President Hoy. Councilor Hoy has not responded. This evening, I am publicly asking the council some of the same questions contained in that email. Why was the reference to a future Marine Drive not included in the November staff report? Two, why did staff not verify the legality of the stormwater SDC funds used to purchase the Taven property until after I challenged the expenditures last spring? Three, I was, was I wrong to assume council members are prepared to enforce the rule of law? Four, would your belief in the merit of my appeal been the same had I stated that staff presented false and misleading information during my oral presentation. Before you dismiss this last question, I ask you to consider the following. The current Salem Stormwater Master Plan allocates SDC monies by basin and the West Bank Basin has a small conveyance project SDC allocation of $34,000. Yet this council authorized the expenditures of $401,000. Hundred 
The July 27 staff report claimed, quote, expenditure of this total allowance is not allocated to individual watershed basins, but is available for use citywide, unquote. Mr. Davis's report assumes the yet to be adopted language of the draft 2019 Salem Stormwater Master Plan controlled stormwater SDC expenditures in 2019. That was a false assumption. I therefore request that a council member move to rescind the July 13th and 27th denials of my stormwater SDC expenditure appeal. Please confirm that this Salem City Council believes in, supports, and will enforce the rule of law. Authorizing the Taven purchase was an illegal act. In support of this request, I am sending each council member copies of the unanswered August 11th and 14th emails. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, E.M. Uh, Clifford Eifler Rodriguez. Okay, there can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, uh, Mayor, Councillors. Uh, I just wanted to follow up specifically on the email that I had sent you. Um, I did hear your statements uh, uh, at the top of the, the meeting. Um, specifically, what I wanted to follow up was um, the council has uh, planned to reach out specifically to Oregon State Police and their enforcement of the capital steps. Um, I know that that has been indicated by Salem, the Salem Police Department as not their jurisdiction and not something that they would approach um, given those those issues. Um, and it, as the leadership of our city, I, I, I want to know that, that you're reaching out to um, the state government agencies in charge in order to assure that there's safety um, on our streets. Um, I believe that you, like anyone else in the city, want um, anyone to be able to practice um, their their ability to to express um, their First Amendment rights safely. And so that's um, there are a few other items on, in that email that uh, I'd love to, to get responses from. But that specifically is, is my main um, issue today. Well, Clifford, I'll, I'll assure you, I'll be talking with the city manager uh, in the next day or so. And uh, uh, see if we can uh, make contact with the state. Well, we can. We'll make contact with the state police uh, and encourage uh, a closer watch on those capital steps. Uh, certainly, we don't want to see people both seeing groups exercising First Amendment start, you know, duking it out over their First Amendment thoughts. Uh, and so we'll we'll follow up on that. Thank you for asking. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I don't have, I don't think I have anything else. Nope, that's it. We are adjourned.